Okay, and welcome to the next part of our study on the book of Hebrews. We've done chapters one and two. And today I want to try and delve into three and four, actually, if I can, in the same one. Um, because I know we've got quite a bit of ground to cover. But I want to make sure that we look at some of the main points that we talked about when we met together because some people weren't able to be part of that and there may be others listening in who've not been part of it as well so I just want to encourage you this is a an, such a, an interesting book so much depth in it that we're only scratching the surface but if we can begin to get some of these things into our hearts into our minds and into our hearts it transforms the way that we look at our relationship with Jesus and scripture and so on. There's some good things in here. Okay, so Hebrews chapter three, let me read some bits out and then we will tackle them as we go through. So it says, therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. He was faithful to the one who appointed him just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honour than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honour than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are his house if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. OK, so we said that at the beginning, you know, you've got the first couple of chapters of looking at the fact that Jesus is greater than angels and trying to bring some control that is not, that's not put angels up as so important. Here we're looking at chapters three and four are focusing on Moses and saying, Great though Moses was, Old Testament, Jesus is so much greater than Moses. And don't let's put the law and Moses above what Jesus has done. And that's a good thing for us to be looking at today with um, there still are temptations for people to follow the law and go very legalistically where we must remember what Jesus has done. So um, Jesus greater than Moses. And uh, I love the way it starts off with fix your, your thoughts. Um, on Jesus, the apostle and high priest who we confess. I mean, how much do we do that? How much do we do that day by day? That was a question I think I brought in, but it's so important that we fix our thoughts on Jesus, our apostle and high priest, not on anything else. Let's not get distracted by other things. We can get distracted by all sorts of things, but it all goes right when we fix our eyes on Jesus, our author. And how you do that, well, there's different ways. You have your own ways probably but obviously prayer bible study um reminding ourselves that he's with us he said he will never leave us or forsake us so he's not gone anywhere he's with you doesn't matter how you feel at the time he is with you let's remind ourselves of that okay um and uh there's another verse you think about Romans 12 and verse 2 you know it says be transformed by the renewing of your mind you know the more we we focus on him the more our mind is renewed let me just check that one out um, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and uh, I think as we focus on him then our mind gets renewed okay Interesting, I found it that in verses two and five, Moses is spoken of as being faithful in all God's house. And I questioned, was he always faithful? Um, in some ways, no, but I love it that here, um, God through the Holy Spirit is using this writer to say that Moses was faithful. He was seen as faithful. He got it wrong. Do you remember he wasn't supposed to strike the rock and he, he wasn't able to enter into the promised land. And yet, yet, here he is mentioned as being faithful in all God's house. So it's like, okay, there were mistakes. Moses got it wrong, but he was doing what he felt was the best that he could do in the situation he he made mistakes 
but his heart was focused towards God. I want to encourage you. It seems to me that if our heart is focused towards God, he counts us as faithful, even when we slip up from time to time. Okay. Um, and uh, verses five, five and six, look at the fact that Moses was a servant in God's house, but Jesus is a son over God's house. Here again, emphasizing that supremacy of Jesus. Moses was a servant, great, but Jesus was over God's house. He was the builder. He's, you know, so the builder is so much more important than the person who's a servant inside the house. You know, this is the thing. And uh, we are stones as part of God's building. And I wonder if you realize how important you are as a stone in God's building, as um, we're being built together, it says, doesn't it, as living stones. And you take away a stone. If you've got a building, you take one stone away. It, become, it begins to crumble and you get cracks begin to show. And the more stones that get taken out, the more that place is unable to stand. And we are all important. We just so often think, oh, it doesn't matter. It's, it's only me. But we are all important living stones in God's house. And uh, that section there where it says um, in the NIV, it says Moses, this verse five, Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future. And the Passion Translation actually puts it like this from the Aramaic. It says that the Aramaic translation says his work prophetically illustrates that would that would be later spoken and fulfilled. Moses saw and believed that the tabernacle and all its furnishings were an illustration of something greater that God would unveil later on. Isn't that exciting? And Moses could see that the tabernacle and all the things that went into the tabernacle were not just things that he'd put in place, even that God had told him to put in place, but there was a there was a picture there. There was something else that God was prepared to unveil. And Moses prophetically was looking forward. I find that really exciting. Um, we are his house, it says, if we hold on to our courage. They were facing persecution in those days. I spoke about that earlier. Do we need courage today? I think we do. I think there is a persecution today. I think it's just more hidden. But yes, there is persecution. We face it and we, we need courage today. God, give us boldness. Um, that's what we need to be praying for. God, give us boldness. The righteous, it says, are bold as a lion. That sounds pretty good to me. God, make us bold as lions. Um, verse 7 introduces a, another warning about if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion and during the testing in the desert and so on. It's quoting from Psalm 95. And verse 12 talks about no one having a sinful, unbelieving heart. I wonder if we see an, an unbelieving heart as being sinful. But really, our unbelief is a major issue that we are, if we don't believe God, well, we don't even enter into salvation. We have to believe to enter into salvation. But we can be saved. We can be unbelieving believers. I remember that quote from a book I read years ago. Unbelieving believers. And it's like we all have areas in our lives that if we're not careful, they can be areas of unbelief. Let's not be those with a sinful, unbelieving heart. Is that the same as doubt? I don't believe it is. I think it's okay to have doubts. I think we can question, we can have our doubts and our issues, and we can come to God with those. No, it's saying, God, we believe you, we trust you, but we've got, we're have got, we not sure about all these things. And God is gracious, and he often helps us to understand and gives us some answers to those things if we come to him. Um, verse 19 of chapter 3 says... Um, Verse 18, and to whom did God swear they would not never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. So it's talking about entering rest and it's talking about how 
the children of Israel in the desert were unable to enter because they all rebelled, didn't they? And they all said, no, no, we can't go in. The spies went out, they came back um, with some good things, with the fruit. They said that this is the fruit, this is a good thing that we've gone in, this is a good place. But there are giants in the land and it's, it's like, oh, well, we're not going in then. We're not going to do it. God had told them to go in. God has said, come on, you can do this. You can get, you know, I'm opening the way. This is the way. And they're saying, no, we can't do it because of the giants. We can be put off by giants, can't we? We can be put off by things that scare us, things, so-called barriers and problems that we see. But if God has said, go forward, then we can do it. And um, we mustn't stop from entering his rest now the rest talk about here is really about salvation entering into the promised land of the spirit of salvation but i think it applies to all sorts i think you can still enter into salvation but i think we can miss out on things because we refuse to believe or we don't trust god and we don't enter into the full rest he has um rest what a great thing that is amongst the world today you know so many people need rest with fear anxiety and so on at an amazing epidemic level the enemy is having a field day with people saying i'm you know i'm so anxious i'm so fearful and god is saying there is a rest to enter into he has a rest for those who come to him and trust him and we may even have stepped into salvation, we may believe in him, but we need to live with that understanding of rest, don't we? That actually he has it in control. And it's not about trying to make it happen, it's resting in what he has done for us. If you go over to chapter four, it continues this theme of rest and saying that there is still a Sabbath rest for the people of God. You know, God rested on the seventh day and uh, it's again as i say it's mainly about salvation but it also seems to include this idea of trying of resting in god's grace not trying to earn it you can't earn what god has already provided for us and given us as a gift because if if we earn it it's not a gift it's wages you know the wages of sin is death the gift of god it says in romans is eternal life it's a gift. It's not something we can earn. It's not something you've done because of how great you've been. It's only through him and everything else comes that way too. Um, and his rest is already a reality, but we need to make sure that we enter it. Interesting. Um, verses 1 to 10 then talk about this. They talk about the work of God. Um, and God rested, we know, on the seventh day of creation if you go back to genesis and look at that it's quite interesting because the seventh day of creation is actually different to the others we could go into that in more detail but i don't want to go down rabbit trails but it's interesting that all the other days have it says um evening and morning being the first day the second day but when you get to the seventh day there is no mention of evening or morning so many feel there is a special significance to that um, and God is, of course, always at rest in himself. He's not striving. He's not struggling over what's going to happen. He has it in control. Um, verses 11 to 13. That's read. Really, I've not read a little bit for a while. Um, Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Talking about the children of Israel who didn't go into the promised land. Um, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Well, and faith therefore can be we can say that faith is the right response to the word of God when the word of God says things. And the word of God, this is why we need to read these scriptures. We need to get not just, you know, the, the odd word that comes out, the brief little thing that you might get on Instagram or something, a verse, every one verse or whatever. 
We need to soak ourselves in the scriptures. We need to read our Bibles. We need to have them, um, read them day by day and really understand them and study them, ask questions and dig into them so that we get an understanding of God's great scope of salvation and what he has done. You won't get that from short verses. And we need to get that so that it's strong within us so that we can enter into rest, so we can have faith, our faith based on something so strong. Um, and how do we stay in that place of faith? I think that's part of part of this. We trust God. We spend, we pray, we read our Bibles, we declare God's truth. And when things get tough, we say, God, I trust you anyway. Um, and I, I answer the question, is rest something you enter once and for all, or is it something you do daily? I think there's, it's, Probably yes to both. I think, you know, it's, you enter once for all as a Christian when you become a Christian, when you step into faith and into salvation. But I think there's something day by day we need to step into that as well. Um, and in verse 14, it talks about a great high priest who's gone through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God. Um isn't that great? He, you know, rather like the high priest who entered the Holy of Holies once a year, Jesus entered the Holy of Holies in heaven because the tabernacle was a copy of what goes on in heaven. That's part of what Moses was looking forward about and saw there was something more to the tabernacle rather than just a tent in the desert with some things in he knew it was a picture of something in heaven and when jesus died he went into that heavenly tabernacle if you like into the holy of holies into the presence of his father with his blood as an offering and we might see more about that later on but it's just amazing that here is such a picture of what he did and it says He's not one, verse 15, who sympathises, who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses because he was tempted every way as we were. Um, and I don't know about you, but that encourages me that Jesus, OK, he didn't fail. He was tempted. You can be tempted. It's not sin, by the way. So he was tempted, but he didn't fall into sin. No, we fail. We get it wrong. But. Jesus knows our weakness. He understands. It doesn't mean that he, he sort of says, well, that's OK. You can do what you want. But it does mean that we have a high priest in heaven who understands and makes intercession for us. Isn't that good news? So that's a quick run through chapters three and four. We'll look at chapter five at least next time. But God bless you and be encouraged and focus on your high priest. God bless you.